So far, we have seen how changes in growth, meaning height and weight, might be influenced by the development of the skeletal and muscular systems, respectively. We've already mentioned how changes in fat or adipose tissue also change with age. Now we'll spend some more time examining the development of adipose tissue in greater detail. Adipose tissue increases with age. Like muscle, adipose cells develop as a function of hyperplasia and hypertrophy. Hyperplasia continues from prenatal development through the first six months of postnatal development and again during puberty. Once additional cells are created, those cells remain across development. What I mean by this is that even in cases of severe malnutrition, there is not a loss of adipose cells. Hypertrophy increases the size of adipose cells, but this is not significant until puberty. At birth, adipose accounts for only about a half a kilogram of body weight. There is a large increase in body fat during the first six months of postnatal development, with a peak in the adipose development during the first month. For both males and females, there is a gradual increase in adipose tissue until age 8. During childhood, the amount of internal or visceral fat increases faster than the amount of subcutaneous fat or the fat just below the skin. This is important because visceral fat is thought to be more dangerous because it surrounds the vital organs and is considered to be a greater risk factor for metabolic disease. Subcutaneous fat increases between the ages of 7 to 12 or about 13. Sex differences in adipose tissue become more obvious around puberty. From the ages of 8 to 18, females increase adipose faster than males. The rate of increase is similar for the trunk and the extremities in females. Males show a pre-adolescent increase in adipose in the arms and to a lesser extent in the trunk. However, males show a large decrease in adipose in the arms during puberty, which is evident in this graph from ages 11 and a half to 18 years. Overall, females have about 14 kilograms of adipose compared with 10 kilograms in males. Adipose tissue continues to increase across adulthood. This is likely due to poor diet and a lack of exercise. Between the ages of 20 to 50, females gain about 11.8 kilograms of adipose, while males gain 8.2 kilograms of adipose. Although the total body weight declines after age 50, body fat continues to increase. Recall that the main cause for age-related weight loss is due to a loss of muscle mass and bone mass. Importantly, although subcutaneous fat in the limbs tends to decrease in aging, the amount of visceral or internal fat in the abdomen increases. And as we've mentioned in a previous slide, visceral fat is a risk factor for cardiometabolic disease. We need to keep in mind that data regarding the rates and amounts of adipose tissue during aging could be skewed because those with increased fat have higher mortality rates. Therefore, those individuals' data cannot be counted in the statistics for older adults. In addition to greater mortality rates, increased body fat affects movement by increasing the inertia of body segments, increasing joint pain or joint problems, and increasing social anxiety when participating in physical activity. Therefore, those that have increased body fat will have a more difficult time using exercise or physical activity to help reduce fat mass in particular. Thus, the combination of diet and exercise can help to reduce the amount of fat mass or reduce the rate of fat mass gain during adulthood. So far, we have discussed the systems that contribute to the growth patterns and height and weight, namely the skeletal, muscular, and adipose systems. Now let's examine the endocrine system, which is one of two systems that controls the growth and maturation of all body systems that we have discussed so far. The endocrine system regulates other systems through hormones. Hormones are chemical messengers that are produced by glands and transported through the circulatory system to target organs. The hypothalamus in the brain regulates the pituitary gland, which in turn regulates the adrenal glands, thyroid glands, and reproductive organs which secrete sex hormones. The endocrine system regulation of growth depends on the interactions among hormones, genes, nutrients, and environmental factors. During development, an excess or deficiency of hormones may affect normal growth and development. 
Three types of hormones stimulate protein anabolism, which results in the substrates necessary for building tissue of systems like the skeletal, muscular, and adipose systems. We will discuss growth hormone, thyroid hormones, and gonadal or sex hormones in the subsequent slides. Growth hormone stimulates protein anabolism so that new tissues can be built during childhood and adolescence. Growth hormone is secreted by the anterior pituitary gland, which is located at the bottom of the hypothalamus at the base of the brain. A deficiency in growth hormone results in reduced growth or in extreme cases, a cessation of linear growth. The pituitary gland, in addition to secreting growth hormone, also secretes thyroid stimulating hormone. This hormone regulates secretion of thyroid hormone from the thyroid gland. This system is called the pituitary thyroid system. The hypothalamus regulates the pituitary secretion of thyroid stimulating hormone. This system is called the hypothalamic pituitary thyroid system or the nervous system thyroid system. Thyroid hormone acts on nearly all cells in the body. These hormones regulate basal metabolic rate affect protein synthesis, like in the building of muscle, affect long bone growth in conjunction with growth hormone, promote neural maturation, and regulate body temperature. Other thyroid hormones participate in protein, fat, carbohydrate, and vitamin metabolism. Gonadal hormones affect growth and sexual maturation. They stimulate the development of secondary sex characteristics and the reproductive system. Androgens, like testosterone, are produced by the testes and the adrenal glands in males and the adrenal glands in females. Androgens increase the fusion of the epiphyseal plates and promote skeletal maturation. This maturation comes at the cost of linear growth, such that early maturers tend to be shorter than later maturers. Androgens also contribute to the adolescent growth spurt and muscle mass. The greater muscle mass accrued by males during adolescence is due to the fact that in males, androgens are secreted by both the testes and adrenal glands, while in females, androgens are only secreted by the adrenal glands. In females, estrogen secretion from the ovaries and the adrenal glands results in the epiphyseal closure and increased fat accumulation, particularly in the breasts and hips. Although both males and females have both sex hormones, the relative proportion of androgens and estrogens defines the major characteristics of each sex. So far, all of the hormones we have discussed have had a direct impact on growth and maturation. Insulin, on the other hand, has an indirect role in growth. Insulin is produced by the pancreas. Insulin is critical for carbohydrate metabolism and stimulates the transport of glucose and amino acids through membranes. Insulin is also necessary for growth hormone function. Insulin deficiencies can also cause a decrease in protein synthesis. The endocrine system and nervous system function together. As we have previously discussed, the hypothalamus regulates the secretion of pituitary hormones, which regulate the secretion of other endocrine gland hormones. Imbalance and reduced effectiveness of the endocrine and nervous systems can increase risk of disease and age-related degeneration. Specific glands also exhibit reduced functions with age. Hyperthyroidism, which is an increase in thyroid hormone, can result in congestive heart failure. Hypothyroidism, which is a decrease in thyroid hormone, is associated with accelerated aging. With respect to gonadal hormones, androgen and estrogen replacement therapies can reduce the effects of aging, like muscle wasting and osteoporosis, respectively. Lastly, the incidence of insulin deficiencies like type 2 diabetes also increases with age. This results in greater glycogen storage and reduced glucose metabolism during exercise. In this last section, we will discuss the development of the nervous system, which is a second control system important for normal growth and development. As we saw in Chapter 4, the development of the nervous system begins early during prenatal development. By week three of embryonic development, the nervous system has started to differentiate from somatic tissue. Much of this early nervous system development is directed by genetic factors. These genes direct the development of cell growth and build the basic neural circuitry. However, extrinsic factors are necessary to fine tune and maintain important connections across development. 
During prenatal development, proliferation of immature neurons, the differentiation of these immature neurons into specific neuron types, and the migration of these new neurons to their final location takes place. 25,000 neurons are formed per minute, and a total of 200 billion neurons are formed in total during prenatal development. During the third and fourth prenatal months, almost all of the neurons have been formed. During the sixth prenatal month, the neurons have now migrated to their final location. During prenatal development, there is an overproduction of cells. This allows the system to eventually prune away or remove unnecessary connections in cells later on. Neurons are the basic cells of the nervous system. They are electrically excitable cells that contain a cell body, also called the soma that contains a nucleus and organelles important for protein and neurotransmitter synthesis. Neurons also have dendrites with branches that sprout from the cell body and receive electrical chemical signals from other neurons. Signals originate in the cell body and are sent through the axon hillock and down the axon. The axon then transmits impulses and neurotransmitters to other neurons, glands, organs, and muscles. The neuronal circuitry is comprised of neurons connecting with each other. These connections are called synapses, and it is at these synapses that electrochemical signals are transmitted. Circuits are maintained when cells fire together. Branches or circuits are pruned or eliminated to maintain only the necessary connections. Some developmental disorders may be due to disruptive nervous system development. Disorders like epilepsy, dyslexia, ADHD, and autism may be due in part to differences in cell migration, dendritic branching, neuronal pruning, or other neuronal functions. Although genetic factors are important for laying down the basic structure of the nervous system, extrinsic factors can also affect prenatal development of the nervous system. Nicotine exposure or prenatal exposure to alcohol affects cell migration, dendritic branching, and or neuronal pruning. At birth, the brain is about 25% of its adult weight, but the brain undergoes rapid development during the first two years of life and eventually reaches 80% of adult weight by age four. This increase in weight is due to an increase in cell size or hypertrophy, increased branching, and increased number of glia and myelin. Each neuron can create 1,000 to 100,000 connections. Extrinsic factors like poor nutrition can have a long-lasting effect on the nervous system's growth. So unlike catch-up growth in height or weight, the nervous system may not recover after periods of malnutrition or disease in early postnatal life. Many studies, including those by Greenow and colleagues, have found that environmental enrichment, such as the availability of auditory, visual, and motor stimuli, can increase the number of synapses compared to standard cages. In later studies, Greeno and colleagues compared a running wheel with more motorically complex environments, including those with obstacle courses. The central nervous system is comprised from the bottom up of the spinal cord, medulla, cerebellum, pons, midbrain, diencephalon, and cerebral cortex. The spinal cord and brainstem, which is comprised of the medulla, pons, and midbrain, control automatic rhythmic movements and reflexes, which dominate fetal and newborn movements. The development of goal-directed movement during infancy and childhood promotes development of many components of the nervous system, particularly the cerebral cortex, cerebellum, basal ganglia, and spinal cord. The development of pathways between brain regions results in the increase in the speed of transmission of neural impulses. This occurs as myelin wraps around the axons, creating an insulation that prevents the loss of electrical impulses down the axon. The pyramidal tract, which is also called the corticospinal tract, connects the cerebral cortex with the spinal cord. The spinal cord then activates muscles to cause movement. Motor pathway development occurs in the cephalocaudal direction, taking place in the brain first and then the cervical region of the spinal cord. Myelination then proceeds down the spinal cord to the sacral region. Within the spinal cord, myelination first occurs in the motor areas, or the ventral root, and then in the sensory areas, the dorsal root. The sensory pathways from the body to the brain mature earlier than the motor pathways, which exit the brain to the body. 
The first sensory pathways to mature are tactile and olfactory, or smell. The next sensory pathways are visual and then auditory. Like the development of many organ systems, the nervous system undergoes dramatic changes during adolescence. This is a period of massive pruning, myelination, and cell hypertrophy. Adulthood is typically associated with a decline in the number of synapses, reduction in neurotransmitters, and reduction in myelin. However, some brain regions may actually exhibit growth, including the development of new neurons, also called neurogenesis, and the development of new synaptic connections. Although some brain regions may be maintained during adulthood, typically declines in the nervous system, particularly slowing, is evident during aging. This slowing may be due to inefficient networking, due to cell or dendritic loss, or degradation of the cells. This results in an increased reaction time and response time to external stimuli. Extrinsic factors are important for maintaining connections and nervous system integrity. For example, exercise can increase the blood supply, dendritic branching, and glucose metabolism in the brain. Exercise can also stimulate neurogenesis. Perhaps as a result of the changes in the brain, exercise has been associated with improved cognition and the maintenance of cognitive abilities in aging. Okay, let's recap what we've discussed so far in this chapter. First, we've discussed the development of the different body systems, including the skeletal, muscular, adipose, endocrine, and nervous systems. These are all structural individual constraints that can affect the timing and quality of movements evident across the lifespan. These body systems are related to each other, and thus the development of one system affects the development of other systems. Many of these systems follow a sigmoidal developmental pattern with rapid growth observed during prenatal and early postnatal development, followed by a gradual development during childhood, and then again another period of rapid development during adolescence. Lastly, although genetic factors are important for creating a foundation for the development of each system early in development, extrinsic factors like diet, exercise, and exposure to good and bad environmental stimuli becomes more important during later development.